Good morning, everyone. First time I've spoken to people without a mask in a while, so nice that you get to be here. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. As you heard, I'm Laura Von Temple from the University of Maryland, and I am honored to be speaking with you this morning. I appreciate you taking some time out of your schedules to join us here. We'll be talking about updates on the management of atrial fibrillation. I'm going to ask you to rethink some of what you think you know about the management of atrial fibrillation. Essentially, we're going to look backwards in order to move forward. My audio okay? I think I need a little bit better audio. Sorry about that. Is that better, everybody? Yeah? Got a thumbs up. Okay. So, here it is, atrial fibrillation, narrow complex, irregularly irregular, no discernible P waves. You've all seen this, you've all taken care of this patient. I know you've all, everyone out there is taking care of this patient because this EKG came off of the chest of one of the 35 and a half million people in the world that we know of that has atrial fibrillation. So when you get this EKG put down in front of you, what do you want to know about this patient? What are you curious about? Well, obviously I can't actually hear your answers, but I trust, I trust that you're saying things like, why is the patient there? What do they look like? What are the rest of their vital signs? And these are all valid questions to ask. Of course, you want to know, is this patient having chest pain? Are they having angina? Perhaps they're having their anginal equivalent. They have unclaimed diaphoresis. They have pain in their jaw. They have pain in their shoulder. Maybe they're in congestive heart failure. And of course, of course, we all want to know what is that blood pressure with that patient. Are they hypotensive? And if your patient is experiencing any of these things and you believe that atrial fibrillation is the primary cause of these problems, then the management of that really hasn't changed very much. You're going to cardiovert that patient. You're going to grab your biphasic defibrillator, sit to 200 joules, make sure that sync button is on to minimize the risk of an R on T phenomenon, and you're going to cardiovert that patient. This therapy really hasn't changed much for nearly a century. Yes, we've gotten better defibrillators, we've gotten better pads, we've learned more about proper pad placement, we've added in some adjunctive drugs, but this is the mainstay of the management of unstable atrial fibrillation. However, most of the time when you get this EKG, the patient's okay. They maybe they're there because they have some palpitation. Maybe they're feeling anxious. Maybe you have that complaint of, I just don't feel right, I feel Perhaps they're hypertensive, uh, normal tensive or a bit hypertensive, more likely to be hypertensive as a risk factor for atrial fibrillation in the first place. And now you have a moment to stop and think. In emergency medicine, we're often, often called to action. We have to treat the patient first and figure out what happened later, and that's due to the critical nature of our patients, and that is absolutely the right thing to do. But here, you have a moment to pause and think. So before we jump into action, before we talk about what's new and what we're going to do to treat this patient, let's first take a moment to pause and think about about the dangerous and potentially treatable causes of atrial fibrillation. The list is not long. Please pause for a moment and think. Has your patient had an MI? Is this a post-MI dysrhythmia? Do they have a pulmonary embolism as the cause of their atrial fibrillation? A disease that certainly every emergency physician worries about all the time. Are they hyperthyroid? Are they in thyroid storm? Or perhaps they're hypothyroid and they took too much of their supplementation medicine. Or maybe they took in too much of a difference in pathomimetic, like cocaine or pseudoephedrine. And of course, you want to check for those extreme electrolyte abnormalities. Because if you do not focus on these underlying, potentially treatable, reversible problems, your likelihood of successful management of your atrial fibrillation is going to be low. So let's say you've ruled these things out. Your patient has AFib, there's something treatable or reversible as the underlying etiology. The next question you want to ask your patient. The next question that I ask, the next question that I'm sure all of you ask, because we all have been taught to ask, is how long have you had your symptoms? And really, what we want to know, have you had your symptoms for more than 48 hours, or have you had your symptoms for fewer than 48 hours, or are you not sure how long you've had your symptoms? This is actually a slide from a prior talk I gave not that long ago on the subject. 48-hour rule. If I think you've had your symptoms for more than 48 hours, or if it's an incidental finding, went to a doctor's office for some other reason, you're found to be in atrial fibrillation, you, we don't know how long you've had it, we always defaulted to the rate control strategy. But if you were within that 48-hour window of symptoms, the teaching was, since the mid-90s, that it was at the clinician's 
discretion. I can do rate control or I can do rate control. Your choice. This is what we were taught. This is what I have done. This is what I've practiced. This is what I've taught others, as you can tell from my prior slide. But this has recently come to question. And that's what we're going to really focus on today. One of the earliest studies that brought this into question was a study done about, about six years ago that looked at patient retrospective studies. These patients were all cardioverted with their symptomatic atrial fibrillation within 48 hours of presentation, so fully following the standard of care. But this group took a look and divided patients into three groups. Uh, patients that had symptoms for up to 12 hours, 12 to 24 hours, and 24 to 48 hours. So again, all within that 48 hour window. And they collected a lot of data on these patients. But I just want you to look at one line, and this is the line I want you to focus on the risk of thromboembolic events. Because that's what we worry about when we rhythm control someone with atrial fibrillation. We worry that we're going to precipitate a thromboembolic event such as a stroke. If you look in this first group, the risk of a thromboembolic event was 0.3%. The overall risk of a thromboembolic event in this group of about 5,000 cardioversions was 0.7%. So is 0.7 within your risk tolerance range? Well, that's a personal decision for you to make. If you take 1,000 hemodynamically stable atrial fibrillation patients and you rhythm control them, you're risking causing a stroke in about seven people. That's in your risk tolerance range. That's for the individual clinician to decide. But we're trying to narrow that. Risk. We're trying to make that risk smaller. We're trying to do this as safely as we possibly can for the patient. And in the first 12 hours, that thrombomolic rate with 0.3%. But once you cross beyond 12 hours, that rate nearly quadrupled. It went to 1.1%. Now, 1.1% is not within my risk tolerance. 0.3% certainly is. So this really made people stop and think, is that 48-hour rule as steadfast as we think it is? The 48 hours was based on, by the way, the idea that it took that long of atrial dysfunction the left atrial or the left atrial appendage to form a clot. Within 48 hours, the thought was you can't form a clot that quickly. You're not going to form a clot. <coughs> Therefore, when the atrium starts to beat properly again, you're not going to have an, an embolism to cause a thrombo. You're not going to have a thrombo, excuse me, to cause a thrombo embolic event. So this gave people pause. This was followed a couple years later by a second study, which equally questioned our practice of cardioversion, pharmacologic or electrical, in the emergency department for symptomatic atrial fibrillation. Now this focus not on the duration of patient symptoms, but rather on the patient's anticoagulation status at the time of their cardioversion. It looked at events at the time of cardioversion and events in that particularly vulnerable 30-day post-cardioversion period. That is when you're at higher risk for your highest risk for your thromboembolic event. The thought that there is atrial stunning, the atria, although contracting, is not contracting well. There's some pulling of blood. You can cause a thrombus. You can create a thrombus in the atria and then have a subsequent thromboembolism. This looked at approximately 1,500 cardioversions. This group looked at 1,500 cardioversions in patients, all, again, all in that 48-hour window, patients that we would stand in, standardly think that we have the option for rhythm control. And they looked at patients who were not anticoagulated at the time of their cardioversion, or sub-therapeutically anticoagulated, or fully anticoagulated at their time of cardioversion. These patients were all on warfarin or heparin in 2000. This is just when the novel oral anticoagulants were coming into widespread use. So patients on those drugs were excluded from the study. All patients had, were on warfarin or heparin. Therefore, their level of anticoagulation could be monitored, knowing, therefore, if they were sub-therapeutic, therapeutic, excuse me, or not anticoagulated at all. And interestingly, they took these three groups of patients and plotted of them against their CHAD2 vast score. So CHAD2 vast score. Now, CHAD2 vast score we typically think of as a tool for the risk of annual thromboembolic events in patients. But they took it and used it in a different way. And as you can see, not surprisingly, patients that had a low CHAD2 vascular, so a low baseline risk of thromboembolic events, didn't have any thromboembolic events if they were anticoagulated fully or not anticoagulated at all at the time of their cardioversion. But here's the interesting part. As the CHAG2 VAS score went up, the rate of thromboembolic events went up in the patients that were not anticoagulated, but it went, it had, there were very few events in the patients that were anticoagulated. 
the rate for patients who were fully anticoagulated at the time of their cardioversion was 0.2% of that. So lower than that overall 0.7 that we kind of uh, expect for the overall thrombolytic event rate within the first 48 hours. So interesting. We've now looked at duration of symptoms and anticoagulation status at the time of symptoms, which hopefully should have you stop and pause and, and rethink that 48 hour rule. Rethink what you think you already know about the management of atrial fibrillation. And some of you are doing that, but some of you are murmuring. Even with social distancing, I can hear you murmuring. And what I'm hearing is some of you are saying, why bother? Why would I do this? Why would I put my patient at any risk for a thromboembolic event for a cardioversion if I can just rate control them, and hopefully discharge them, maybe admit them, have them follow the cardiology, and have someone else make that decision outside of the emergency department setting? And that is not an unreasonable thought. Actually, in 2016, the European Society of Cardiology came out with a statement that said, although we want to believe that maintaining sinus rhythm improves the outcomes of AFib patients, all trials that have compared rhythm control and rate control to rate control alone with appropriate anticoagulation have resulted in neutral outcomes. So, you're right. They're equal. And rate control is a viable management option for patients with atrial fibrillation. And if you are listening to this, from within the United States, then you probably think about rate control as your primary method of treatment for your symptomatic patient with ACIF. But if you are listening to this from outside the United States, you probably think of rhythm control as a primary treatment modality for your symptomatic patients with atrial fibrillation. This was a survey done uh, uh, several thousand emergency physicians were surveyed. There were no real patients. There was no risk involved. The question was, how would you treat a symptomatic patient with atrial fibrillation who came into your emergency department? And one of the many questions was, would you consider cardioversion? In the United States, just one in four emergency physicians said they would even consider cardioversion, the hypothetical patients on the survey who came into their emergency department. But if you look outside of the United States, such as the United Kingdom and in Australia, about half a doc said that they would consider cardioverting a patient. And in Canada, which we know is very aggressive about rhythm control from the emergency department and discharge to home, about two-thirds of doctors said that they would cardiovert that patient. So whether you go with rate control or rhythm control, when we know it's safe to do, which we're going to talk about really what that window is going to be now, not that 48 hours, is probably heavily influenced by the culture in which you practice. Which, now, outside of the United States, specifically in Canada, we're again very aggressive about rhythm control for the emergency department. And this data that we've looked at, plus some more we'll discuss, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society put out a 2018 focus update on the management of atrial fibrillation. They made multiple recommendations in that document, but really two are relevant to our practice in emergency medicine. And the first one is this. It says if you're going to cardiovert your AFib or A-flutter patients in the emergency department, and they're not already anticoagulated, presumably for, for something else, you can do it. But here are our guidelines. Cardiovert that patient who presents with non-valvular atrial fibrillation within 12 hours, 12 hours of symptom onset if they haven't had a stroke or TIA within the past six months, because a recent stroke or TIA is an independent risk factor for having a thromboembolic event. So your window just went from 48 hours down to 12 hours for these patients, significantly smaller than it was. But the second recommendation, within the second part of this recommendation, is also that if you miss that 12-hour window, if you're in that 12 to 48-hour window, so you can still consider it, but calculate the patient's thromboembolic risk based on tools that we have typically used to calculate long-term annual thromboembolic risk. Here they use the CHAD-2 score. CHAD-2 score, less than 2, not less than or equal, but less than 2, they consider cardioversion. This recommendation was based on some of the studies we talked about, plus it also pulls heavily from the Finnish CV study. This is a study of patients who were cardioverted within 48 hours, again, within that 48-hour time window. They looked at all sorts of complications, including specifically thromboembolic events. Now, their overall thromboembolic event rate was 
Now, back to that 0.7%. We all seem to hover around that 0.7% for all comers. But when you dig down, when you look at individual patient characteristics, the range of those thromboembolic events was 0.2 to 9.8%. Now, 0.2 certainly is within my risk tolerance range. I'm okay with that. 9.8% certainly, certainly is not. I don't want to take the risk performing a procedure on someone with nearly a 1 in 10 chance of causing a thromboembolic event such as HIV. So what do they find? What puts you, what risk factors puts you more at this end, the 9.8% end of the spectrum, rather than that much safer 0.2% end of the spectrum? And what they found out was that congestive heart failure was the single uh, most predicted independent risk factor for thromboembolic event. And then they looked at things like age and diabetes and vascular disease, female gender, and then, of course, circled back to that longer duration of atrial fibrillation. So look at the first five characteristics here. CHS, age, diabetes, vascular, and gender. Do those ring familiar? Well, they ring familiar to me. They seem a lot like the CHADS-2 VAS score. These are many of the components of the CHADS-2 VAS score. So again, the idea of using this tool, which we didn't typically use for short-term risk calculation, to now bring it back to use for short-term risk calculation. The combination, that which was at 9.8 end of the spectrum, 9.8% end of the spectrum, was the combination of CHF and diabetes. When patients have those two risk factors, without any of these others, the thromboembolic event rate was up to nearly 10%. CHAD2 VAS score, just to take a step back to review here for a moment, as we said, typically calculates your annual thromboembolic event rate for patients with atrial fibrillation as your score goes higher your thromboembolic event rate goes higher as well. And if you look down here at this end of the spectrum, if your CHADS2 VAS score is zero or one, you have a very low rate, zero, zero, right? Uh, even with the ones, 1.3%, 1 very low annual thromboembolic event rate. So this tool is now being widened in its use. What else? Well, there's always that bottom one, longer duration of atrial fibrillation. We've already seen some data about that, and this Finnish CV study looked at that as well. There was actually another paper that came out that would use the same data, looked at it a different way, really focused on the duration of symptoms, and this is a graphic from that paper. And if you look, the blue lines represent the male patients, the red lines represent the female patients, so there certainly is a gender difference. We know that female gender is a risk factor for thromboembolic events. But what, to me, is more striking is that the solid lines are patients who had their symptoms for greater than just 12 hours. The dashed lines are patients who had their symptoms for fewer than 12 hours. And you can see the difference here, so particularly significant difference in thromboembolic event rate within that 12-hour window and beyond that 12-hour window. And you may say, that's great. Okay, I got it. You convinced me 12 hours, that's what I need to know. But how do I really know? What about that sneaky entity called silence atrial fibrillation. Does it exist and do I have to worry about it? Well, yes, it certainly exists. There was a meta-analysis done that looked, over 10, looked at over 10,000 atrial fibrillation patients, patients with the history of atrial fibrillation that were wearing pulse monitors, and 43% of those people had an episode of silent atrial fibrillation within a 24-hour period. 43%. That is a tremendous number. But yet, Despite those brief or sometimes prolonged episodes of silent atrial fibrillation, the thromboembolic event rate in that group remained low. Yes, silent AFib exists. It absolutely exists. But silent AFib does not appear to be a major risk factor for clinically significant thromboembolic events. We do think that you have small thromboembolic events related to silent atrial fibrillation possibly thought to contribute to atrial fibrillation-related long-term dementia, perhaps, but not the major big territory CVAs that we think about when we think about the risk factors for atrial fibrillation. So every study that I've read, all these studies that we're, that we're referencing, when they talk about symptoms, they talk about the onset of patient symptoms. So when we talk about duration, we talk about the onset of patient symptoms. So the clock starts when your patient feels all right, that brings us back to the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and on to recommendation number two. Recommendation number two was certainly a bit more controversial, and this is what it said. If we cardiovert you, regardless if we use pharmacologic or electrocardioversion, we recommend 
four weeks of anticoagulation. All patients across the board, no matter what, four weeks of anticoagulation. That's different. That's a very different recommendation from anything that we've had before. Pretty much what they also put in was a value judgment. and said we're more worried about our patients having a stroke than in them having a stroke. We were, we're more worried about, we, we were focusing more on preventing that stroke than worrying about a patient having a bleed. They did put the value judgment. Essentially what this does is it takes all of your risk stratification tools, your CHADS2 score, your CHADS2 VAS score, or the CHAD65 algorithm, which is preferentially used in Canada, and it, it throws it out. It says, you don't have to think about this. Just anticoagulate for four weeks. Now, in emergency medicine, this could potentially make our job easier, right? I don't have to think. I don't have to calculate any of this stuff. When I cardiovert you, I just put you on anticoagulation for four four weeks time, I send you home, I have you follow the cardiology, someone else makes those tougher decisions. So our job could potentially get easier for this. <clears throat> However, this is controversial. It's different and people had concerns about it. And this recommendation is in direct opposition to the 2019 American Heart Association, American Car College of Cardiology and Heart Rhythm Society recommendation. This is a 2019 focus update on the management of atrial fibrillation. And this says, if we cardiovert you, calculate the CHATS2 VAS score. And if it's zero or one, don't anticoagulate. There's no need for long-term anticoagulation. So when such controversies exist, people offer opinions. And one of the many opinions that were offered was by Ian Steele himself. You know, Ian Steele, obviously, based on his literature, aggressive about rhythm control in the emergency department and discharge to home. And he offered a different perspective. And a different perspective was, I don't want to anticoagulate young, healthy individuals without other risk factors. They are younger, they're more likely to engage in sporting events, they're more likely to engage in activities that put them at risk for trauma, therefore put them at risk for bleeding. So what's the answer here? The answer here is, I don't know the answer here. This is still up in the air. You know, tune in, come back, re-register next year. Maybe I'll have an answer for you then. But as of right now, this is where we stand. If you're interested in what I do personally, I follow the American Heart Association rules. I realize that the risk factors for someone who has a CHAD2 VAS score of 0 or 1, the risk of a thrombomolic event is very, very low. So for now, for me, if you're in that low risk category, I'm not going to anticoagulate you if I cardio for you. So, bottom line here, when you think about that 48 hour rule, I ask you to stop and think, because that 48 hour rule is simply not the same for everyone. You need to individualize your decisions for that patient based on that patient. Here's the takeaway. Sure, cardiovert, I love rhythm control in the emergency department. I think it is a good thing to do. Cardiovert that patient, if they get to within 12 hours of their symptoms, they have not had a CVA or a TIA in the prior six months. Also, if you miss that 12 hour window, that's okay. If they're there in that 12 to 48 hour window, calculate a CHAD2 VAS score or perhaps use the CHAD65 algorithm. Uh, that's one that's often used uh, up in Canada. Whatever risk stratification tool you want, use that. If they risk stratify to low risk for thromboembolic events, you can go ahead and cardiovert that patient as well. As far as decisions with anticoagulation, that's going to really be a multi tiered approach. I suggest you use a thromboembolic risk stratification tool. You use a bleeding risk stratification tool, such as has bled or other, and you engage with your patient with shared decisions. My ultimate goal is that with this new information, when you see this EKG, you can turn this EKG into this EKG of sinus rhythm, or this EKG of rate controlled atrial fibrillation based on the timing and the risk factors of your independent of, of each patient that you take care of. And the ultimate goal, of course, is to choose a path based on the evidence, the one that's right for your patient, and leave your patient looking like this. And not only do I mean your patient should be happy, which they should be, but I want you to notice there are equal nasal labial folds, equal eyebrow raise, equal strains of the upper extremity, no thromboembolic events have happened. That's it for me. I thank you uh, very much for spending your time with me, and I really appreciate all the work you all are doing in this fight against COVID. Now that I'm uh, done here, I'm going to put my scrubs on and join you back uh, in that fight in these interesting times and uh, visit one space.